So I'm joined today with our resident process improvement and built environment expert, Anthony Alfredi, who is our director of uh, customer advisory here at QuickBase. I appreciate you joining me, Anthony. Thanks, Joe. Glad to be here. So let's just start here. I want to talk a little bit about um, kind of what was your first, what first got you interested in, in building processes and um, kind of touch on the start of your, your background. Well, building processes really has to go back to when I first started uh, engineering back uh, when I was 18. So um, we're, it, it's really interesting. I got, uh, I got a really good, huge taste of, of engineering uh, when I was working at a tier two manufacturing and automotive and the process and, and, and the procedures on how to actually make car parts. Uh, and I got really um, curious about it. And then I uh, went to engineering school to, to follow really up on that, pro on that passion. Oh, that's excellent. So, so then tell me a little bit about how your background in engineering is, can be applied across business processes and project management. What are some things that you learned there that apply broadly? A, a lot of the lessons that I've learned from, from engineering really apply to process improvement. Um, there, you're always looking for the best way, the most efficient way to make a quality product overall. And it could be a quality process, uh, utilizing you know, scientific method, following um, standard checklists, ensuring that you're having um, constant feedback from your customers all has to go into the process improvement process. And that's uh, one of the main things that I was really looking forward to and getting done um, in my automotive experience, as well as uh, working in construction. That's excellent. So what do you think, uh, if you had to kind of distill it down to your motto as far as what you what you drawn from drawn from your previous experience when it comes to process what would you say how would you summarize that my motto when it comes down to process is make sure you follow the four p's um people plans parts and process um and the process is making sure that everybody understands what exactly they have to do when they have to do it how they have to do it where they have to do it and why they have to do it Love that the four P's. So I've heard you talk talk before a little bit about discipline and standardization as kind of necessities for businesses that are scaling. Why do you think that is? I'm sorry. Can you repeat that? Sure thing. <laughs> sure thing. So I've I've heard you talk previously about discipline and standardization as being really necessary components for businesses to scale and to succeed. Why do you think that is? In order for a business to scale really has to count on all of the individual parts doing the same thing over and over and over again. So in the case of let's, let's just say in the case of an Amazon, Amazon is all over the, all over the country. Um, you can't really be it everywhere at once. So what you want to have is a very disciplined process. It's not too complicated so that everyone can follow it. So you're going to get the same result over and over and over again, following that same process. Do you think those two things then, do you think that, that those are, they feed into one another or do you think they're kind of two sides of the same coin? You think standardization in order to be standardized, you need discipline or do you think it's vice versa? Or they kind of, they go hand in hand with one another. Uh, well, at first you really need to have a disciplined environment. Otherwise, if you have a standard, no one's going to follow it. Um, and that, that's kind of how I see it. If, as long as you have a culture of discipline and then you're able to put the standards in place, then you'll get a very good quality product at the end of it. Um, but to, the counterpoint to that is in order to, to create a disciplined environment, you need to have standards. So uh, it, it's a little, uh, it's the same coin, uh, two different sides. Uh, you kind of have to do both of them at the same point in time uh, and, and progress, uh, progress with your employees so that they do have standards and they do have discipline going forward. I think that's interesting. When you talk about, do you think, um, I don't know, do you feel like, do you feel like a, if you are in an undisciplined, if your, your business has an undisciplined culture, do you think that's something that can be learned or do you think you, you just need to start over anew? What do you, what do you think that looks like? I think for the most part, most, most folks really want to work in a disciplined culture. Um, it, discipline when it comes down to, you know, following processes and procedures, it, it's very, demoralizing if you work in a, in a culture where the policy is changing or the procedures are changing every day. Um, 
the uh, the overall standardization will follow a- as you're increasing your your discipline as well. I mean, you can get more and more complicated processes when your discipline is is adhered to. What kind of really think technology plays in that? Well, technology certainly has a big big play when it comes to standardization and, and discipline. Um, because we're so we're so spread out all over the United States. Most of the countries, uh, most of the companies that we're working with in this country are are uh, have a vol- multiple locations. Technology allows for uh, a, either a change or enhancement to a process to happen simultaneously across all um, locations at once. So you don't have to do a rolling um, a rolling type of uh, implementation phase, you can do it uh, all at once, which is a huge deal when it comes to technology because it allows you to flip the switch right then and there. Um, the, the other big piece is technology also allows you to be mobile. Uh, the, because we're traveling and because we're doing, we're getting for, more and more back into the, the normalcy of the operating um, pattern of a workplace, the, the mobile part where everybody was so used to for the last few years in, in getting that in the workplace is where a big part of technology comes in. Now, I, I want to touch on this too. So, I mean, you mentioned your, you know, your initial background in manufacturing and getting it at 18 years old and to the point that we are now with, with your, your role with QuickBase. Uh, how have you seen technology involve in your career when it comes to kind of process improvement? Oh, that's a that's a long question. Um, I'll try to shorten that one up for you, Joe. We'll take the long answer. So, go on, the bit the biggest piece that I I've seen um, it really comes down to, I, I would say for the last like ten the first ten years of my career really came down to statistical process control and going from your handwritten X bar and R charts, which is a a, a process control method into getting something that was computerized into, you know, your then going into something that would be more like an Excel so that you could actually see it and, and, and get it into a spreadsheet so that you can act upon it. Um, moving, moving in that direction was, was a big, big transformative, transport, transformative, trans, what transmore, transformative, <laughs> transformative, uh, method to get it to, to, to see where quality could really improve over the last 10 years because we are the first 10 years of my career. Um, we were competing with the Japanese, you're competing with, with German companies where it became a multi, um, multi-country uh, global environment. And that's where a lot of the quality improvements happened in the first 10 years of my career. And then after that, it became into getting more and more complicated with the implementation of uh, of fast programs, and what I mean by fast programs is you're, you're going to want to increase your speed to market. And technology was a huge help in getting um, products to market a lot faster. Uh, before you were having a six to seven year product cycle for automotive, and then we had to get down to four years, and then now it's it's even shorter than that. So. The, the biggest piece there was technology and the communication, the enablement of the, the information engineer at that point in time um, was a big transformative, transformative um, uh, process. And then now I would say, it, now it's gone even further. Um, it's really getting down to the, to the actual operator um, or the, the builder you know, on a construction site where the individual the individual operator really has all of that information at their fingertips so that the, their processes and their feedback can get instantly back into a, a, a database or the cloud. And that is where I see um, Industry 4.0 with IoT and a lot of these emergence technologies coming together to give you an instant feedback on what you're doing at that moment in time. It's really That's really, really interesting. What is something that you think that you know, anyone in the built environment or what do you think they're getting wrong about their project processes? What are people getting wrong with the project processes? I I think one of the biggest things that I see in the built environment um, during the construction phase is that they're not able to identify a risk early enough in the process. 
which which leads to a project delay. And that is one of the things that uh, I see that can be done better. Um, and it can be done better through communication, uh, through technology. It can be done better by implementing a uh, logic into your into your program that you're utilizing. It can be done by um, understanding the the details of each jurisdiction that you're working in. Um, I think there's I think all three of those that I just mentioned um, help you enable uh, to identify risk earlier on in a program. I think that's really the, the risk mitigation is a, a massive factor there that we hear about all the time. I so you've talked you've talked a lot about about kind of these you know what looks good and and, and risk mitigation all these different items and kind of the evolution of tech. I, I want to touch on too, kind of specifically and tactically. How do you define what a good process? If you were if you were if you were defining it from scratch, let's talk about what a good process looks like. And um, what would you say are some key markers to success that that should influence how you're defining that? Key markers to define a good process. Well, outside of the four P's, um, making sure that they're all there really comes down to, um, is it easily understood? Um, that is a key to a, a very good process. If, if people can't understand it, then it, you, you won't end up following the process to begin with. Um, the Another another good key back, um, another good key of a process is making sure that you have a good feedback loop. Um, a lot of times a process will just be a one-way direction. Um, you want to ensure that the last step in your process includes feedback. If you do not get that feedback, you can't improve. Um, a lot of the, a lot of situations that I see right now are you you won't get that feedback, and you'll constantly be you're you're constantly asking for that feedback after the fact, um, and it's too late. It's got to be built into your process, and I think that's a key a key point that should be in every um, good process at this point in time. That's interesting. How do you let's 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 delve into what that feedback is a little more. Then, do you is that a, you looking for something quantitative there? Is it just uh, or is it just kind of anecdotal from the folks that are you know on the ground level actually embedded in the process? What do you think? So it can be a combination of both. Most good surveys are typically about five to five to ten questions, no more than that. If you go longer than that, then people are kind of going to skip over it. But um, if you're looking at your process. You want to you want to have a, a, a quantitative portion of, that uh, you can you can metric and you can put a KPI to. Um, each KPI could be you know speed to resolution. It could be um, you know a, a more of a purchasing or a cost KPI that you're you're tracking. Um, it could be a number of times that a person had to call back for clarification. I mean, there's there's quite a bit of that feedback you can quantify. Uh, now going into more of the the individual verbatims from a customer, those are those are like gold because you're actually putting the person's words to the KPI, and you need both really to understand what they're where they're coming from and what they're trying to convey to you uh, in that feedback loop. I think that's a that's a really important point. Um, so I want to I want to kind of delve even a little bit more into how you've done this in the past and and how you've approached kind of process improvement and where you've come in and, and laid the groundwork there. And I was, a, you know, spoken with you previously, probably even prior to your role with, with QuickBase about the work that you had done at, um, at Amazon. So I want to touch a little bit on that and let's start with what was your role there? So my role at Amazon was the senior startup manager for the Midwest, where I had to open up New delivery stations, which is a, the last mile for Amazon, um, up and down uh, Michigan, all the way down to Miami, uh, was just a very simple way of saying where my ter my territory was at this point in time. But having a, having a group of very talented startup managers that worked for me uh, that were able to go to all these sites and open them up was uh, was my role. Awesome. So let's talk a little bit about about the process there. So. Let's walk through when you're establishing kind of these launch centers, what you were responsible for with establishing the standards and and what that entire process looked like. So Amazon, just to give a little bit of background on that. Um, so Amazon in, in the early beginning of opening delivery stations uh, made a, a business decision 
uh, before I came over to, to Amazon, um, made a business decision to open up delivery stations and create their own logistics network so they could deliver their own packages. So there's there's three steps to uh, there's three steps to actually delivering a package, Joe. There's uh, fulfillment when you actually order the stuff and it goes into the box, which is the fulfillment centers, which are the very large buildings that you see um, typically closer to airports. Um, and then you have the middle mile, which is a uh, what they call a sort center where the packages that you, you just ordered from fulfillment will get shipped to a sort center and they'll get redirected in a sort center or what uh, logistics companies typically call a cross stock operation. Um, and they'll, they'll get shipped to the closest zip code where a delivery station is. Um, and then the delivery station was, is where the van actually del- picks up the packages and, and takes them to your house. Um, so building that entire last mile network is what Amazon wanted to do instead of contracting it out to the postal service or UPS or FedEx. So they made a business decision um, to to do that. And they started prototyping and and getting those buildings stood up in 2018 with a few of them. Um, And then in 2019, they expanded that. And then they asked me to join in 2020 for the big push. And the big push was to create well over 400 of these buildings uh, nationwide. So I'm, I'm, this is myself as part of a team of a lot of people to, to put it together. Um, so the, the previous prototyping um, and uh, early startup, what they did is they took a uh, unknown process and they started to document it and they started to find out what they were doing right and what they were doing wrong. Um, and, Amazon is a, is a written culture. So that written culture really played into standardized operating procedures and the way that they do business is all done on paper. Um, so they took each, I would say, critical element of putting a building together, the last mile building together, each critical element had an SOP that was associated with it. Um, and those SOPs were refined um, in 2018 and 19 and then put into big big operation in, in, in the last push there in 2020, 21 and, uh, the first half of 22. So that's, um, that's where really, if you have a good process that has been vetted, um, it leads way for, um, automation. And that's, that's kind of where I came in. Excellent. So I want to touch on, let's touch on those SOPs a little bit then Mm -hmm. and, and building the automation to that. They covered, what do they cover? They cover the full gamut from getting the site set up to uh, operations. What's going? What what did that look like? So let's uh, let's give a quick explanation of what a delivery station is. So um, a delivery station has uh, racks. It has these these bags that you put the boxes in um, and that that zip up. You've got conveying systems that convey the package from the tractor trailer to the the actual area where the the bags are. Um, and then you've got desks and and uh, facilities that help that run, right? So you've got quite a bit of equipment inside of these buildings. So what a startup execution person does um, is that we work hand in hand with a construction environment team. So the construction team uh, obviously identifies the, the design of the building, works with a design group, and then uh, builds the building. And you can build it in three different ways. You can do a, a market refurb, um, where you're actually refurbing a, an existing site. You can do a spec building, um, which is taking a, an existing logistics hub and then turning it into an Amazon building. And then you can do a, um, a build to suit, which is basically Amazon um, design from scratch. So uh, each of those buildings has, a, has the same equipment in it, no matter what. And my job was if you took the building and shook it, if you took the building, turn it upside down and shook it, all the stuff that fell out had to fall was in uh, startup execution's responsibility. So the physical building um, was construction's responsibility and how they um, how they got it and got their certificate of occupancy. And then I worked hand in hand with that team to ensure that all the stuff could go in the building and work properly so that it could be handed off to operations. Um and now I, you, you have to forgive me because I actually forgot the the, the question. I just was giving the background. <laughs> no, that's great. That's what we wanted. That's what we wanted to get to. What would you say? So let's talk about the 
what are the biggest challenges that you were facing with that? I mean, I think time is a pretty clear one, but I, yeah. yeah. So yeah, no, t- time obviously is a, is a huge one. So time and money, I mean, they both go hand in hand, but the biggest thing is, is the, the time from certificate of occupancy or when construction hands over the building to um, startup execution for the stuff to go into the building to the time where it act to it goes into operation is only six weeks. So it is a very fast moving ballet of parts and people um, and getting everything into that building and up and running. Um, there is quite a bit of coordination that has to happen it, at least 20 weeks prior to um, what they call day one. Um, and, and day one obviously is the first day of operation, but um, there there is the communication, the, the tracking, the, um, the risk mitigation, all of that has to happen well in advance to make sure that you are going to hit your target day. Because just think, you got all these employees that are going to start and you really can't tell them the day before that, hey, we're not going to open today. You have to, you have to know that well in advance. Yeah, that's the the clock is a major factor. I think with any with any major projects. Yeah. What so then? Uh, you were talking about you know Amazon's a paper uh, has a paper culture, and I think that's true of a lot of businesses. Right. Um, so what was your what was your tactic then to try to overcome that? Well, at first it, it really became um, you start off by trying to put some discipline around the amount of paper that comes in. Um, you have to start with that. Uh, and, and the amount of paper that was coming in and the shared files um, was extreme. So in the beginning, just understanding your your uh, your deliverables and making sure that they were all categorized properly in the, in the right locations was, was a challenge. Um, that was the first part of the problem. The second part of the problem was how can we make this better or how can we how can we alleviate the load off of these startup managers and these construction engineers that are out in the field um a lot of that came into well why can't we just put it in the cloud um and that's uh, that's kind of where i came in with because i had previous experience with quickbase um i understood that a lot of these forms which were done in excel and which were done in word um could easily be created uh, and automated inside of, of QuickBase. And we were able to go, um, for, we, we made a priority list based off of criticality and understood where which ones we wanted to work on first. Um, it worked our way down in a, a very large list of standardized operating procedures for, for our department, created a uh, roadmap, so to speak, uh, of which ones were gonna be done by which day. And then within, six, seven months, we had, I would say, critical mass of all of the starting of the startup operating procedures done inside of QuickBase. That's great. I, love, I mean, I personally love to hear that. Um, something I so I, I will say that we found that I think our listeners love hearing really tangible examples of how things how things work and how people are getting their getting their work done. So, so since we've talked about this project at length, um, what would you say in hindsight, what went really, really well? And what would you say if you could go back and try it over again, you would, you would have done differently. Okay. Um, I, I have no problem talking about mistakes that I've made <laughs> uh, because it, it's only a way that you can actually get better. Um, and I love teaching people what I've done wrong. Uh, the, the first, the first, uh, first thing mistake that I would talk about how, how you can do it better. What would, The, the biggest biggest piece is having an understanding of the data that is coming into you. Um, my, my first stab at it was to, um, how do I want to explain this in layman, uh, in, in terminology that's not going to be uh, too crazy, but basically is to create a data layer and data tables that are easily accessible by everybody that wants to build an application. Um, as long as you have that, then you're able to move application building and taking all those standard forms. Um, you can you can create those pretty quickly inside of QuickBase if if you already have your data layer established. 
doing your data layer at the same time as building an application is um, it's doable. It's just a lot more difficult. Um, I don't suggest it uh, based off of experience that uh, that you want to do that. You really want to take a few key people in the beginning, understand what the underlying data is. That is, and what I mean by data is the, the, the pieces that get reused over and over again. Um, addresses, names, um, it could be just a, a form that just those pieces, you want to have a clear understanding on how they're going to fit into each um, process so that it can be reused over and over and over again without having the questions come up. And that's where the critical mistake was, is that if you're trying to build it at the same point in time as your data layer, if you're trying to build apps, same time that you're trying to create a data layer is uh, is confusing and, and causes it, it causes a lot more stress than really what you need to do. Now what went right? <laughs> so let's talk about that. Um, so what went right? So we had a lot of really good successes. Um, the team, I would say what went right was the the, the training um, and the adaptation of, of QuickBase. Um, we had an, uh, a really good experience through uh, Apathons, which are a uh, which are an event where builders people that we've identified that were going to create applications, which we call builders, um, where they will all come together for a three day event. And we start working on that priority list that I talked about earlier. And we identified the maybe 10 to 15 applications that we were going to work on during that Appathon. The best thing about the Appathon is, is that you're working so shoulder to shoulder with experienced um, teachers and tutors. So you're, your ability to create a viable application at the end of the third day um, greatly would, would, would could easily be done. So it was a uh, it was a great way to get it taken care of, um, get speed to implementation um, done, and that's one of the one of the highlights of what I would say we did right. That's that's excellent, and I, Anthony, I really appreciate you sharing your experience there. Um, I think there's a lot that people can a lot that our listeners can can draw from that. I want to want to shift gears a little bit here and just kind of talk about your perspective of of the industry with what you're what you're touching on now. So we'll start with this. In your opinion, what do you think is the most significant challenges that businesses in the built environment are contending with today? In my opinion, I, I still believe it's risk mitigation. It's, it's identification. It's identification of risk mitigation, and, and that comes from honestly, it comes from the hyper fragmentation of data. Uh, the the amount of general contractors time that is spent collecting and analyzing all the subcontractors reports making sure that they're following either a quality checklist or, or following timelines or making sure that the orders for supplies got placed on time is is a huge issue um let alone the weather i mean acts of god are always going to be there but you can you can prevent a lot of the issues through early risk mitigation. It's just a question of how much time are you going to be allocating to spend putting all of those data together, and that's that's the biggest issue. Um, jurisdictions and permits <clears throat> can always can always put a wrinkle in your plans. You never never have complete clarity until the piece of paper is in your hand and signed, um, and that's you know part of risk mitigation. You want to make sure that those are all taken care of, but all of that really has to do from uh, that hyper fragmentation of data. You know, you're, you you need to have your electrical contractor done uh, when he says he's going to be done, and knowing that earlier in the program would be certainly beneficial to mitigating risk. And that's um, I see that's the biggest challenge right now uh, for construction industry is is that. How do you think that that plays into your your four Ps? People, plan, parts, and process. Um, it really it, it comes down to uh, I would say people and parts. And I'm just going to take a stab at it, but because not having the right person on the job at the right time is uh, is a big issue. Um, and if you don't have an earlier early understanding, if uh, if somebody is going to be out um, or uh, I, I wouldn't say I would say pre committed. Um, for another another uh, project, you need to have identification of that so that you can make a, a change for your subcontractors. Um, and then parts. 
parts is the big one. Um, steel industry, having an understanding of where the, the, the support beams are coming from. If you have to change uh, suppliers, you need to find a supplier early on for these long lead items. Uh, and if they can't meet the timeline and, or identify that they can't meet the timeline, you're going to end up delaying your project. Um, that was a big, big issue. And it still is a big issue. The supply chain still hasn't fully recovered from, uh, from COVID. And I still think there's going to be a uh, supply chain uh, accordion effect over the next few years. And that, uh, identifying those, those parts, like roofing materials, you would have never thought that roofing materials could delay a project. And the reason why it, is because of supply chain. And that is one of the things that we were able to mitigate early on because we had identified it earlier on in the pro process. So that's, um, again, you know, but you're going to talk to your roofer. And if you don't have that constant communication chain set up, um, you're not going to be able to mitigate your risk earlier. It goes back to the original question there. Yeah, perfect. I think that that tied it up nicely. So I will, I'll get into, I always like to close these, these couple of icebreaker questions and, and Anthony, I really, I can't thank you enough for your time today. This has been Anytime. a really fascinating discussion and uh, super enlightening for me. Um, it's a little bit of a, a little bit of a marketing um, tradition now that anybody knew that, that comes into the fold, they get asked these three questions and okay. they are your first car, first mm -hmm. job and first concert. First car. Okay. Um, my first car was a 1989 Ford Tempo, gray, five-speed, red interior. <laughs> um, I drove that car forever. That thing, um, it got me through college, got me uh, for actually my first job, which was at Ford. Um, so it was great fit. It was uh, super reliable, and I had uh, had a great time in it. So that was my, my first car. Um, first what was a oh, first job Ford. <laughs> so my first job was at Ford motor company. Um, I, uh, like I said before, I, I went to engineering school, uh, in, at Worcester Polytech and, um, typically the, the big three GM Chrysler and Ford back then, um, they, uh, they did not hire from the East coast. It was, um, very, I don't, I don't know. They typically hire, I mean, they have their target schools and that's Midwest, but I wanted to be an automotive. Like I, I've been an automotive, you know, earlier on, um, I was working in automotive before I was actually, uh, um, going to make my career in, 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 uh, engineering. So I knew I wanted to be an automotive. I just didn't. So I, I made a targeted approach to, to Ford, uh, and I was able to get a position and I loved every minute of it. It's still, um, it's still a big part of me and, and I still consider Ford part of my family. And then my first concert. Uh, okay. Well, this might be embarrassing, but it's not embarrassing. <laughs> uh, so I, I'm going to give you two, an I'm going to give you two answers. So the first concert that I went to, um, with my, with, with parents, I, I want to say that because I was very, I was younger, um, was the, um, oh shoot. The Go-Go's was the Go-Go's. Um, yeah, they were great. I love them. But my first concert that I went to with just my friends and I was Duran Duran. So, <laughs> I mean, I know I'm dating myself, but um, back in the day, those were huge names. Um, waiting in line to get concert tickets, going to the concert, being part of that crowd. Um, still will never forget it. It was uh, incredible. So, and I do still like going to concerts now. Neither of those, you teed that up like you were going to give a really embarrassing answer for the for the concert. Neither of those are really. Oh, there's yeah, no, there's super talented bands. It's just uh, it dates me. <laughs> <laughs> well, and and I have to I have to admit that that coming into this, knowing your background and knowing where you are, I was excited about the first car uh, question. I knew that that would that would head in a fruitful direction. The the last thing I want to ask Anthony, it's once again, well, first I'll thank you again for for sitting down with me is. Anybody that is interested in learning more about you, following following you on socials, where can they find your work and, and keep up with you? So uh, you can find me on LinkedIn. Um, just look up my name, Anthony O'Freddy. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm always checking uh, messages. I have a very large network uh, of folks. Uh, I do post some really cool things. 
uh, that I find interesting about data analytics or um, building low code uh, uh, applications. So please uh, take a look at take a look at me online. I have no problem responding to you. Awesome. Thanks again, Anthony. It's been a real Thank pleasure. You.